Welcome to this episode of Substantial Matters, Life and Science of Parkinson's. I'm your host, Dan Keller. At the Parkinson's Foundation, we want all people with Parkinson's and their families to get the care and support they need. Better care starts with better research and leads to better lives. In this podcast series, we highlight the fruits of that research, the treatments and techniques that can help you live a better life now, as well as research that can bring a better tomorrow. Motor symptoms such as stiffness, slowness of movement, and tremor are hallmarks of Parkinson's disease and can often be controlled with levodopa or other similarly acting medications. But non-motor symptoms can be just as or more troubling to a person with Parkinson's. An example is feeling nausea with Parkinson's, which can result from the disease itself or be related to anti-Parkinson's medications. When I spoke with Dr. Andrew Fagan of New York University Langone Health in New York City, he told me about the causes of nausea, medical and non-medical ways to help alleviate it, and just how prevalent it is. Nausea is quite common in Parkinson's disease. If you look at, you know, during the course of a person's Parkinson's disease, how likely are they to at some point experience nausea? I'd say probably more than 50% of people experience nausea at some point, either due to the Parkinson's disease, and we could talk a little bit more about that, or due to side effects of medication. Are there any people who are particularly affected? Can you figure out who's most at risk, or is it pretty random? I think it's mostly pretty random, actually, to be honest. The underlying cause in some people with Parkinson's disease who have nausea is a problem called gastroparesis, which essentially means poor emptying of the stomach. And who that affects, why that affects some patients with Parkinson's disease more than others, I think is hard to predict. And just some people are affected, and some people quite severely affected by it. I've seen patients who had a significant enough gastroparesis or incomplete emptying or slow emptying of the stomach to the point where they had no appetite, lost weight, became dehydrated, and others seem to have not have that as a symptom at all. And it's hard to predict who will be afflicted with this and who won't. Does that also affect absorption of medication, any oral medication? It does, yeah. So sometimes people with Parkinson's disease can have what are called delayed ons or dose failures when they take their levodopa, they take their medication. And, you know, many people, it's very predictable. They take their levodopa in particular, and it kicks in after 15 to 30 minutes and lasts a certain number of hours and then wears off. Some people, it doesn't kick in in a predictable way. And oftentimes the reason for that is that the medication is not passing from the stomach to the first part of the small intestine, which is where levodopa gets absorbed in in a regular, predictable way. Right. So it's sort of stuck before it ever gets absorbed. Are there other common causes of nausea and PD, the medication itself or food or any activities? I'd say the other main cause of nausea, maybe the most common cause of nausea in patients with Parkinson's disease is the gold standard therapy for Parkinson's disease, levodopa. When people take levodopa, Levodopa is converted to dopamine by an enzyme called dopa decarboxylase, and that can happen before the levodopa gets into the brain. So levodopa is always given with another medication called carbidopa in a combined pill, sometimes referred to as Cinemet because of the old brand name of the drug. Carbidopa is there not to treat the Parkinson's disease. The carbidopa is there to block this enzyme, dopa decarboxylase, from converting levodopa to dopamine before it gets into the brain. If levodopa is converted to dopamine before it gets into the brain, it can cause quite a few side effects, one of which is it can bind to dopamine receptors in the stomach and in the intestines and can cause nausea. I guess that's the origin of the name cinemet, sin without in Latin, met, emesis, nausea. So why doesn't it work? Is it that they're both being delivered at the same time? If carbidopa got there before the levodopa, would it work better? It turns out that we say that the average adult person needs a minimum of 75 milligrams of carbidopa to block peripheral dopa decarboxylase. But that's very variable from person to person. Some people require more carbidopa than that, and some people require less. 
So I think that when somebody's starting carbidopa levodopa for the first time, first of all, we tend to start at low doses. We tell them to take half a pill twice a day for a week, half a pill three times a day for some period of time, and then go up to a whole pill three times a day. If you take a whole pill of 25,100 carbidopa levodopa, you get 70, you get that 75 milligrams per day of carbidopa. But if you're starting with a half a pill twice a day and you're half a pill three times a day, you're not quite at that kind of average amount of carbidopa that you need to block peripheral dopa decarboxylase. So, you know, for many people, the amount of carbidopa that they're getting with their levodopa is not sufficient. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because usually when people feel uh, nauseous from taking levodopa, we do kind of non-medical adjustments like telling people to take their medication with food or with more water. And often that's effective for helping the nausea. But sometimes if we do choose to treat it medically, we will give people extra carbidopa. So you can take pure carbidopa. We can prescribe what's called lodosin, or it's the brand name for just pure carbidopa. And you can take an extra 25 milligrams of carbidopa with each dose of carbidopa levodopa. And that can be sufficient for ameliorating the nausea for some people. So is the nausea really originating in the gut? I mean, there are central brain mechanisms which make you feel nauseous, but is it really because the levodopa is acting in the gut? I think it's probably actually the action of levodopa at these peripheral receptors is being conveyed to some central mechanisms that are causing the nausea. I don't think it's the actual gut that's causing the nausea, although it is possible that that may be contributing, yeah. You described that there is medication so you can get more carbidopa to block the levodopa in the gut. Are there other ways that it's treated? I think you said behavioral changes and things like that, but how effective are those and what else might there be to do about it? I think taking the, the carbidopa levodopa with food is quite effective. I'd say that helps a lot of people who have problems taking low doses of, of carbidopa levodopa. And then adding extra carbidopa is also quite effective. For those whom the dietary changes don't really seem to make much of a difference, adding extra carbidopa can also be helpful. And then finally, there are other medical treatments. There's a drug called domperidone, which is not FDA approved, not available by prescription in the United States, but is available by prescription from Canada or from Europe. And that medication blocks dopamine receptors in the GI tract. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it doesn't block dopamine in the brain. We wouldn't want to give a drug that blocked dopamine in the brain to somebody with Parkinson's disease for obvious reasons. People with Parkinson's disease have too little dopamine to begin with. If you give them a drug that blocks dopamine in the brain, you're going to make them worse. But this particular drug, Domperidone, blocks dopamine only peripherally and doesn't get across the blood-brain barrier. And so that drug can be very effective in blocking some of the peripheral side effects of dopamine or levodopa converted to dopamine. And sometimes we do resort to that. There are some risks associated with domperidone in that there have been reports of people with increased risks of cardiac arrhythmias and other cardiac problems. And so, you know, when we do do that, we have to do it with some level of caution. Do the Drugs that are approved in the U.S. that are often used for nausea interfere with dopamine, things like ondansetron and things like that, or are they effective here? You could use typical antiemetics, and we do on occasion. And those drugs are used in particular. Actually, one of the drugs that we use for Parkinson's disease that very commonly causes nausea is a drug called apomorphine, which is a potent dopamine agonist. And probably the mechanism by which it causes nausea is similar to how levodopa being converted to dopamine causes nausea. And so treatment with apomorphine requires pretreatment with an antiemetic, an anti-nausea drug like you mentioned, actually. But don't people use that as sort of a rescue medication for off periods? So do they get nauseous when they inject that? Well, they have to pre-medicate with one of these drugs, yeah. Either as an injection or it's now available as sublingual. And even so, you still need to pre-medicate with an antiemetic. How long does the nausea last? Does it actually interfere with them eating something and they get deficient in calories? Or does it pass and they can then eat regularly? So the nausea that is associated with gastroparesis in some patients with Parkinson's disease, it can vary in severity. It can be mild nausea now and then that doesn't seem to have an impact on their weight. I have seen patients with Parkinson's disease who became almost cachectic because of this feeling of fullness in their stomach always, even when they're not full, and very significant effect on their appetite. And so they don't eat as much and lose weight. So it's quite variable, actually. Cachectic meaning they lost so much weight that they're very skinny and are kind of not getting enough nutrition. 
What other behavioral or dietary changes? Are there certain foods that are worse than others, or it's just generalized? You can't tolerate anything when you're feeling nauseous? I mean, occasionally you'll see patients who will say certain foods seem to make it worse than others. But I would say I, I couldn't give any kind of generalizations about that. You know, when we start telling people to leave their carbidopa levodopa with food, it gets into the issue that a lot of people are familiar with these days, that protein can interfere with the absorption of levodopa. And so I would say that I try to minimize that as a concern. Most people who are just starting on levodopa are not really noticing either too much on-off types of fluctuations, uh, meaning their levodopa is kicking in or it's wearing off. And so this kind of difference between whether they take it with protein-containing food or not is not a big difference. And so I try to minimize that. But for some people, that could be an issue. If protein interferes with the absorption of levodopa, does it also ameliorate some of the effects in the gut or it's just bad news? You're not absorbing it, but the levodopa is still causing nausea. It would limit the amount of levodopa you're absorbing, and so it would reduce the amount of levodopa being peripherally converted to dopamine, so it could alleviate the nausea by that mechanism. But the concern would be that it would also limit the effectiveness of the levodopa. Although, as I said, in my experience, I think when people are first starting on levodopa, this issue of not noticing a complete effect of the medication because of eating it with protein, I wouldn't say it never happens, but it's not the most common problem. What about dividing small meals across the day? Would that help? That can be helpful when people have gastroparesis, limited or slow emptying of the stomach. Yeah, we often recommend smaller but more frequent meals, more fluids, just to kind of give the stomach a chance to get empty so that sensation of fullness that can lead to uh, nausea. What about increasing carbohydrates or increasing glucose and water and electrolytes? We always are recommending people keep themselves well hydrated, in particular with electrolytes, not just pure water. We're getting away a little bit from nausea here, but one of the other potential side effects of levodopa being converted to dopamine before it gets into the brain is that people can have drops in their blood pressure, causing lightheadedness, and there are other potential side effects, constipation and other issues. So we do recommend that people keep themselves well hydrated, especially with fluids containing electrolytes. And of course, exercise is recommended for everything. Is it recommended here? There are reports that people who do more exercise can improve the motility of the GI system, and so it potentially alleviates some of the nausea that they get from the Parkinson's disease and potentially even from side effects of levodopa. There's no downside to exercise. We recommend exercise for all of our Parkinson's patients regardless, but I think it can be helpful for nausea as well. I guess if you had to encapsulate the overall recommendation, what would you tell people who either want to avoid nausea or have to deal with it? So I would say, first of all, I think figuring out the cause of the nausea is important. Is it from the Parkinson's disease or is it a side effect of medication? If it's from the Parkinson's disease, from the poor gastric emptying, for example, poor GI motility, things like what we talked about, eating smaller meals, keeping yourself well hydrated are important non-medical ways of dealing with it. I think if you're just getting started on levodopa, and it's obvious, in many cases it is just obvious that that's what's causing people to get nauseous. They take their medication, they get nauseous. Some period of time later, the nausea goes away. In that situation, the first thing we usually advise people to do is to try to take the carbidopa levodopa with food and with a reasonable amount of water. If that doesn't work, then you should talk to your doctor about it. And there are other things that can be done, such as extra carbidopa with the medication, and of course, we always recommend exercise as well. You don't want to just keep adding drugs upon drugs and things like that, but are there drugs that promote gastric emptying? As I mentioned, this drug, Domperidone, which blocks dopamine, but only peripherally, essentially works that way. But it's not available here, so people have to order it from Canada. Right, and there are other drugs that also block dopamine that promote GI motility and gastric emptying, like a brand name drug called Reglan or metoclopramide. But that drug is really contraindicated in people with Parkinson's disease because it crosses the blood-brain barrier and blocks dopamine in the brain. So that's not really a viable treatment. Is there anything important or interesting we've missed? My feeling about nausea in Parkinson's disease is that most people can find a way to tolerate their medication. Most people can 
find a way to ameliorate some of the nausea that can come with Parkinson's disease. For those who struggle with it, it can be very frustrating and it can lead to the need to take drugs like domperidone, although we try to avoid it as much as possible. Very good. Good advice. Thank you. My pleasure. For more information on nausea in Parkinson's, go to our newly designed website at parkinson.org, click on the three stacked bars at the top right side of the page, and enter nausea in the search box. On page four of the search results, you'll see a link to a page on constipation and nausea. You can find more information on gastroparesis by visiting parkinson.org slash expert briefings. If you scroll down that page, you'll see a list of past webinars. Look for number 24, called Non-Motor Symptoms, What's New? The relevant section begins at about 37 minutes and 20 seconds on the timeline. There is also a blog post on medications in development to promote gastric motility and emptying, which you can find by searching on Promotility. As always, our helpline information specialists are available to answer questions in English or Spanish about today's topic or anything else having to do with Parkinson's, including finding your way around our newly redesigned website. News and updates about future events and resources are available by joining our email list at the bottom of our website's homepage. If you want to leave feedback on this podcast or any other subject, you can do it at parkinson.org slash feedback. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate and review the series on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. At the Parkinson's Foundation, our mission is to help every person diagnosed with Parkinson's live the best possible life today. To that end, we'll be bringing you a new episode in this podcast series every other week. Till next time, for more information and resources, visit parkinson.org or call our toll-free helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. That's one 800 473-4636. Thank you for listening.